villains, gangsters, or faces as they prefer to be called, are the men that have been making newspaper headlines for all the wrong reasons over the past 50 years. Some are instantly recognisable, but many are not. And if I stick a gun in your face, you're going to open up the door. I've got no worry, but even if the glass is bulletproof, and you know it's bulletproof, you're still going to open up that, because you're not going to trust your life against a bit of glass. Men like Eddie Richardson, Paul Ferris, Frankie Fraser, and Walter Norville, who have inspired fear and respect in equal measure for decades. People did fear me, yeah, because I was dangerous. In this new series, some of Britain's most infamous and influential characters have agreed to go on camera and tell it how it was and is. All of a sudden I went, <coughs> I went you move, I'll blow your fucking head off. Obviously, like, I didn't know that, but big gun in me head like that. I went, ah. So I took a dive when the shot went off, obviously, to get my in motor. And after I got my main motor, I waited two seconds and I took a dive on the front door and I slammed the front door behind us and got behind the brickwork. And that's when the uh, bullets saw kind of coming through the front door. I've had uh, aggravated burglary, torture, um, people being kidnapped and broken legs, broken arms, um, blackmail, racketeers, extortion. I've been done for everything you can think of. I'm not a electrician or a plumber or a dentist or anything like that. I'm a crook and uh, I get back into serious crime and it paid dividends for the next five years. My name is Bernard O'Mahony. I was a friend of the Cray Twins and a member of the infamous Essex Boys firm. I know this world, I know the faces, and I'm going to give you a no-holds-barred history of the British criminal underworld. Think of Bonnie Scotland, and the mind conjures up images of bagpipes, kilts, and breathtaking scenery, but the reality is grim. Violence meted out on the streets of Glasgow has resulted in the city having the highest murder rate in Western Europe. But it wasn't always so. Back in the 1940s, 50s and 60s, villains like Glasgow's first godfather, Walter Norville, attempted to go about their unsavoury business whilst adhering to a now redundant code. So, so how did you sort of descend into crime? I was in the early days when I was young, as I say, my mum was never about. And I got into a wee crowd of pals. And we started off, as I say, just breaking windows and that, and stealing out the windows and that, you know. But when the war came, it was a canter because it was a blackout then. But this time, the police knew who we were. You know, they used to chase us away from the corners and that. But they actually knew who was behind it all, you know, it was who we mob run about together. And while the blackout was on, you could break a windy, you know, and people were never bothered when they heard the noise like that. They were stealing tea and sugar. It was all rationed. They used to sell it to the bookmakers because they used to buy anything off you. Everything was rationed. So we got tea and sugar and things like that. That was the main things. If we were lucky, if we could get eggs, you only get one egg a month on the rations. So we got a wee case of eggs and that. Well, the bookie gave you a fortune for it. After several short terms of imprisonment, Walter's career accelerated from committing petty crime to being involved in more serious matters. This time I'd done a couple of sentences, you know, we once. And I met people for govern and that, go out boys that knew people and that, you know. And, and we decided that we'll start trying something like this. So we found out, we used to get, let's say, go and watch places. And then we'd hit them. We started having maybe we, there were a watchman run this place, used to sit in this place, and the wages used to get delivered to him. So we decided to watch when the wages get delivered, and we sat in a car up the road and we watched it, and we saw the wages get in. There was only the man in the place with a big tray of wages. So we hot that first, and we got them. And it was so easy. I said, oh, this is better than any. So we just started then planning me robberies and hitting banks and different things. It went from one to another, you know and the wee gang got together. But they were awfully different districts. I used to, you know, one, one of the gang would maybe say, so-and-so's a game boy and he's looking for a bit of pie. And so they'd bring him up. But this time I got a flat 
in the Willow Willow Bank Crescent, a three room and kitchen. And we used to meet there. And we'd be sitting there and we used to discuss what we were going to do next. So the one of the boys would maybe I'll let him take my place Walter, you know, and I'd let him get a bit of pay out and you know, everybody was getting a wee wage. The more successful Walter became, the more resentment he attracted from his fellow villains. I was in the house one day, me and the wife, and I had a good drink, mate. it was a Friday night. And the, the door went, and it was a uh, Wally White, and uh, the Queen, uh, Tony Queen, the bookmaker. His wife was staying with Tony White, Tony, a uh, big, big Wally White. Big Wally White was a British welterweight champion. You maybe heard him, and he came through a district, so he came up to see me. And Queen's wife was with him, and this guy was with him. Big guy built it yourself. Gibson, and he landed near the road, and two weeks before I was watching him, he was fighting three guys outside the pub at Marlin, and he was battling for three of them. And I made a saying to my wife, oh God, look at him, I said, he's a big tear away. And I was well known in the road, I'm saying to myself, I hope I don't have to tackle him. But sure as Christ, that night, through the drink, I fell asleep. And my wife woke me up, she says, what, I'm going to put him out? And I looked, and Big White had left with his wife, my Queen's wife. And this big is thrown at the door and I says, I looked to and I was, had a good drink me. I said, come round and I says, come on, you'll need to go away. And he says, put me out. I says, come on, don't act it. I says, come on, out you go. He says, well, I heard you could fight. He says, I always wanted to try you. And I looked at him and I was always be sober. I says, okay, let's do it. I said, but doing the back. So we're doing the stair, and the way doing the stair, I made a bloomer, I walked in front of him. And when we got down to the third flat, he kind of jumped me for the back, and I've been doing the hut this woman's doorstep my forehead, but I turned to her quick and he started to jump on me. And we started to fight. But I had a blade in my back pocket. I just slipped out before I went down the stair. And we rolled about for a while, you know, and then I go and tap him. And I started, and he had his horns over his eyes. But this time my wife had started screaming. And a pally man had run out, stayed up there, just dived out. He was pulling me off him, but I was trying to take his eyes out, you know, stabbing him in the face. It wasn't long before he met up with Gibson again. Both men knew they had unfinished business. I was playing dominoes in the pub, and big Wally West for Postal came in. He was a big hard man for Postal. He says, Walter, watch yourself. He says, Gibson's up there with three handed. He says, they're looking for you. He says, with knives that length. I mean, oh, so I was playing dominoes with two pals of mine. I'll donkey went and John Harris. They're dead, the two of them. But I was playing in dominoes. So I finished the game and I got up and I walked to it and donkey came in the back of me and says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to see him. He said, wait, we'll go. I said, no, I'll just keep it. I said, and so we walked up anyway and then John came up and I know John Harris. And I looked at the door and there was a big in stone in his pals. I didn't give him time, I just walked in quick. I said, you're looking for me, turning the stuck right in his neck. Before he had a chance, I stuck it three times in his chest. And the best time he's trying to get away and he's still going to be in the corner. So I just went after him and he turned his back and got down. I'd done his two kidneys, stuck it in the back of his head. This time, I heard the woman screaming. I blew up. It was all in the back of the bar. And I just got up and I walked away and I went out of his pals. I said, what be you? They all walked away and all. So we just went and jumped a taxi. We did my mother's. And I gave John a cigarette to that knife. Next thing I heard that the murder squad was out looking for me. Supposed to have died in the ambulance. But he died in the ambulance, they brought him down again. Walter's criminal career came to an abrupt halt when he and his gang were arrested following a tip off from a police informant. People loyal to Walter tried to derail the prosecution case against him by blowing up the courthouse where his trial was being held. What was the purpose of blowing the, well, the trial, the court up? The people I met that knew something about it, I knew nothing about it. But the people I know that did know about it, I think it was the people that actually done it. They explained to me that all the evidence was kept the day before underneath in the High Court. 
And as you say, it stood in places underneath the High Court. But there was two High Courts, and there was one on each side, the South and the North. So as far as I heard it, the guys that was interested in doing it was going to hit the two of them. And that's what they'd done. They had the two courts, but the fire brigade got there. Actually, I heard that they were a dug barton. It drew the attention of people to the fires burning inside the court. And that's what saved the evidence for getting all done in. Because the flare would have went through. It seems it was the fire bomb that we had petrol and all that, you know, and these petrol bombs and the whole place was in fire. Was that, they tried us in a burnt court and they finished up. Before the evidence had been destroyed, there'd been no case against you? It was a walkout. Everybody was walking out. Even we friends that I know that was in for the same thing, we Manson and him, their stuff were all went, I know. Another major player in Glasgow after the war was Arthur Thompson. By the 1950s, Thompson and his brothers had embarked upon a life of crime working as bouncers, debt collectors and extortionists. If Walter Norville was the unofficial godfather of Glasgow, Arthur was undoubtedly the undisputed king of pain. He's said to have crucified those that refused to repay their debts by nailing their hands and feet to floors and doors. Earlier in life, Arthur was getting a wee bit of pay off bookmakers and that, and a certain mem certain family was nipping in and trying to be abusive to the bookie. And the bookie told Arthur. So Arthur saw them in a, a van this day going along the road and he flew after them in the car and he ran them off the road. And in the course of it, one of the chaps got killed. They ran out of a post and one of the chaps got killed. So the way it worked out, there was a bit of retaliation. Arthur was, used to have a habit and go in the car, but he, did, he didn't drive the car. There was another wee guy who used to drive him. And this day, the wee guy didn't turn up. I don't want to mention names, you know, the wee guy's alive. And Arthur had to drive the car, and his mother-in-law decided she wanted to run. Don't need to tell you. Switched on the engine, but a bomb under the passenger seat. The woman was killed. Arthur broke his two legs and I got bad injuries in his legs. The woman, innocent woman, and she was killed, but it was meant for Arthur. Unlike Walter, Arthur was happy to deal in drugs and he'd forged links with gangs in Liverpool, London and Manchester. The vast amounts of money he made inevitably attracted interest from rival gangs and warfare soon broke out on the streets. Arthur employed gangsters from London to murder his enemies in Glasgow, and Arthur's men would then travel to the capital to return the favour. Well, I liked him very much. And the Italian Albert, he introduced me to him, and I got very friendly with him. And he'd, I'd go up to Glasgow to see him, and he'd come down to London to see me and visit me in prison and all and everything. I liked him very much. Sometimes we would ask them to do us a favour up there, and sometimes they would ask us to do a favour for them down here, giving someone, you know, a right belt in and that. Uh, when I was a boy years ago, you went to a pub, and it was, well, there's trouble or a skirmish or whatever, all you heard was that's half us pub, that stopped all the trouble. If somebody said Arthur's owns that, need to cause trouble way back then. I mean, it could be quite nasty. Joe Steele's father was also a well-known face in Glasgow, who had ties to gangs in London. He was friends with the Crays. He used to get cards every year at Christmas. And he went down to visit him, I think it was 1969, to visit the Cray twins on remand. And he was arrested by the police. And they said they had a gun in his pocket. So he got three years for that. But the gun was put on his pocket. My dad didn't go to visit with a gun. So he got three years for that. Well, why would the print a gun on him? Because, uh, as I say, he was a safe boy. Um, he, he had friends, he had a reputation, uh, and he was loyal. He would help his friends in trouble. So just my dad's friends and people saying, I think they thought he was doing it to intimidate people, which was accused in Glasgow. 
That was at the time the crazy were on trial for murder? Yes. And he'd gone to intimidate the witnesses? Well, that's what the police alleged. He was going to intimidate witnesses, but he was only there for a visit. And was that something what went on? Glasgow villains going to London, London villains coming to Glasgow? What? Well, Can you I, describe that? I, my dad had a friend, he was a tourist in Glasgow, still is, and he, he was accused of a couple of murders and was cleared. And my dad was accused of intimidating witnesses in their cases, but he was cleared then. Um, so, he, my dad was, he was that well known everywhere he went. He posed now and he was high profile, even away back then. Uh, but as I say, he was loyal to his friends. Paul Ferris is one of Britain's most notorious faces. Known as the wee man because of his size, he's an unlikely hard man. Ferris was employed by Arthur Thompson to carry out attacks on rivals with military precision and merciless ferocity. The mere mention of his name struck terror into the hearts of Arthur's enemies. The reputation came about by probably media led. Uh, they like to put a tag on people that sells newspapers and different things like that. But from an early point of view, I'm not saying the newspapers are responsible for my actions. I'm responsible for my actions. And I knew that at a very early age uh, that I was, I was going to do something back to these bullies. And there was a situation that I've heard recently for a, a well-renowned boxer, Alex Arthur. He was doing an interview and he used a phrase called punch resistant. He became punch resistant after so many years in the ring. Uh, and I, th I thought, I I'm going to try and use that as an analogy to put forward that you become uh, fear resistant. You know, the whole point of it is the fear that you've experienced and the violence you've experienced as an early kid, a young, a young kid, uh, you're resistant to that fear and that level of violence, even meeting the violence out. Well, I met Paul through my younger brother, and, <clears throat> and he, he knew that I was into jewellery robberies and things like that, and he asked to come on board. And uh, I ended up, I've, I've took him to do a few, you know what I mean? How uh, uh, did they work? What did, what did you do? Well, we used to, again, one is we'd get in there, uh, we'd be dressed up and all that, we'd think we'd, and a pair of glasses and suit and all that, and I would get in and ask to see a tree of rings, or something like that. And uh, I'd just run out the door with it, and Paul would be in the corner on the car, then he'd go and do the next one. And so that's that's how we started off, you know what I mean? And uh, what, what about the violence, was it? Well, we started getting into the city centre and things like that, and getting drunk, and we ended up in a lot of thing with trouble with people and we ended up carving out a reputation for serious violence. We were slashing people with Stanley blades in it. And uh, we were actually called the Stanley Gang. But <clears throat> there was a lot of people trying to attack us, so we were just getting in there first. And uh, we came to the notice of Arthur Thompson. And uh, one night, he'd, he'd asked to ping me, for me and Paul, to go to the problem I'm in. And, uh, Paul went and I never turned up, and that was the night he was recruited with the Thompson firm. I was introduced to Tam Began, who was already working uh, with the Thompsons, uh, collected cash all over the city. And I was introduced as what you would call another bag man, another collector. Uh, we never asked any questions about how much was in it, who paid the debt, what was the debt for, it was just things you don't ask. You know, what it was, was you go and see Mr A and collect X amount, and then you take it back. Uh, there was certain uh, times where people had never had the money on a good, the given time. And other people have got a misconception is because they've not got the money, we use the strong arm tactics and go and beat them up and all the rest of it, or threaten them. And that never happened when we were doing it. Uh, but they had, they had to give us something either a time or date to get back to tell uh, Thompson that Mr A never had the money at that time, but we'll go back and revisit him on such and such a date because that's the date he gave us and that would probably be the last date and 
people genuinely had the money on the dates that they said that they were getting. And during the process of this, they had lost something in the region of £50,000 uh, through a transaction that they were doing. And they were given a hold all that had been superglued. And once the, the, the hold all had been uh, cut open at the side, I don't know the significance in it, I still don't, don't know the significance in it. There was two building bricks and uh, a bottle iron brew which is a kind of well-known Glasgow and Scottish drink that was taped, gaffer taped together to give the impression of weight. You know, somebody's handing a hold over, they've got a bit of weight, nothing moves. I still can't understand how somebody would part with £50,000 for a, 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 without checking what was in a, in a particular bag. They saw that as a big insult and this happened roughly around about the time I just joined. So on the process of trying to get this debt back, there was a, a few casualties that were given a message. And the message was that uh, you've took a right fucking liberty be given this bag over and more or less robbed them. Where in, one of, in one occasion, I'd been given false information about a guy called Raymond Bonner, uh, who was alleged to have been involved in it. And they heard that I was coming to see him with regards to the, the 50,000 pounds. And he was armed. I was alleged to have uh, been furnished with this information. And as it turns out in the late, later years, that the guy had nothing to do with it. You know, it was one of the Thompsons that were telling me so that matter of fact, it was one of the female uh, members of the Thompson family who told me about it, and which resulted in Raymond Bonner being repeatedly stabbed, uh, and his dog in the back seat of a vehicle, which caused quite a lot of uh, heat in Glasgow at that time, and I was given the opportunity to kind of move away and go to the Isle of Butte, Rossi. Uh, where Thompson had a, a, a family ho holiday home. Within minutes of Ferris arriving on the island, the police had stormed the house and arrested him. I don't even think we got a meal in the house. Uh, I remember getting a cup of tea, I remember watching the TV. Uh, I remember vividly the sound of wood splintering in the the, the doors come in, and this flat had two outer storm doors, uh, which came in, and the inner door came in, and there was shouts, the armed police, identifying themselves who they were. Uh, and at that time, all I had on was a pair of joggy bottoms and a, and a t shirt. I was very conscious of the fact that I wanted to go out into the hallway with my hands kind of outstretched to indicate that I've got nothing on me. Uh, just in the event that somebody's got an itchy trigger finger and just wants to shoot first and ask questions later. And at that stage, as soon as I've appeared, it happened so quickly, but very professionally. You know, you're bundled to the ground, you're handcuffed, and uh, my left hand side of the, the, the face was on the floor so I could readily see who was above me. And there was one in particular who was about six feet six, very well built, snow white hair. Had the gun jammed in the back of my neck uh, and said, you know what this is, a little bastard, you're going to get it. And at that time, Anne-Marie had just accidentally appeared in the hallway. Uh, and he put up a screen, get a WPC in here. Uh, obviously unaware there was a female in the house, uh, which resulted in loads of chaos. I got lifted up, put into the bedroom, searched, all of this. No, I never thought, apart from a couple of hundred pounds that I had for survival money. But a strange thing happened. They turned around after searching the place, they never found nothing, and then produced a green uh, bank bag. Despite Ferris's claims that there was nothing in the house, the police produced a bag which they said contained drugs. He was arrested 
charged and remanded in custody to await trial. Ferris firmly believed that the Thompson family were responsible for framing him. Only two people knew where I was going. It was Arthur Thompson Sr. and Arthur Thompson Jr. And I firmly believe it was Arthur Thompson Jr. that set him up. Ferris confronted Arthur Thompson Jr. about being set up when they met in Barlini Prison. Stammering and shaking, Arthur Jr. denied all knowledge of any such conspiracy. However, in an effort to save face, when the pair had parted company, Arthur Jr. began telling everyone that he was compiling a hit list and Paul Ferris's name was at the top. Arthur Thompson Jr. signed his own death warrant when he was in prison and be talking about who he was going to kill. And when he got out, issuing the threats again that resulted in his death. So if anybody's to blame for his, uh, his sudden demise, then it's self-explanatory uh, on you can't be threatening people because sometimes people take you serious. Within hours of Thompson being released from prison, he was back drinking in the Proven Mill Inn, where he began reading out his hit list to anyone that cared to listen. And if Arthur thought he was going to get into his own quarters, sit there and talk about killing people and this and that, and it wasn't going to get back to the people. The first person to get back to him was Paul Ferris. He's one of the first ones on the list. So you can't go about bragging. They're going to do this and do that. These guys have got a pal, a lot of people, a lot of friends. They came back from within a matter of hours. If that boy was fun indeed, they couldn't even get back to prison. He was fun indeed, the man, it was less than a day, and the hat last been read out. Some of the friends of life, and he was capable of it. The persons that dealt with fat boy, he was capable of it. They knew that, he knew it, they knew it. He went to the day he sell, not the most day he sell, but he'd have paid. And that was a bit of his danger. It's not a good idea to sit in a crowded pub and read out a list, uh, which top of the list, Paul Ferris saying, I'm going to kill Paul Ferris. Not, not a good idea. Any other time, I think Paul Ferris would have laughed that half. But as I say, you don't laugh half so much at it, but Paul knows in his heart, half of us in the cable to break a twig. But when he, if he was even enough poison enough and bad enough to pay people, even if he gets somebody beat up for fun, a young half of a day, a fat boy would do that, just get people beat up, beat up for fun. Uh, no, nah, he was dangerous with his mouth, dangerous with his money. And in my opinion, rightly so, he threatened a few lives. Maybe home leaving, maybe when is the right time to kill somebody or whatever, but that's it, the only thing is, home leave, he was out and first leave in prison, but as I say, he knew what he was doing, knew what he was talking about, knew who he was threatening, and he paid the price. Later that night, when Thompson left the Proven Mill, a man approached him, pulled out a gun and shot him in the face. The force of the bullet spun him around and he fell to the ground. As he crawled on his hands and knees towards his home, a second bullet smashed into his ribcage, puncturing a lung. The third bullet struck him in the anus, a Glasgow custom designed to humiliate the victim. It didn't take the police long to arrest Paul Ferris and his friend Bobby Glover for the murder, but both men appeared to have concrete alibis. Undeterred by the lack of evidence, the police charged Ferris and Glover with an unrelated offence. When the pair appeared in court, Glover was surprisingly granted bail and Ferris was remanded in custody to await trial. Arthur Thompson Sr. was adamant that he would get bloody revenge for his son's murder. And with Ferris safely behind bars, Arthur's only option was to vent his anger on two of Ferris's closest friends. Arthur wanted something done. And I know the people had done it. And the people that done it were good friends of mine because I knew how much it was for and everything. There was a £30,000 he put in their heads. Bobby Glover and Joe Hanlon. Aye, ah, and that other boy still alive. Paul Ferris. Mm. That was the three that was to be done. And what did happen there was there was a certain party, was at a concert, they were having a concert in Berlin, and he was dressed as a woman. And he escaped out of Berlin amongst the people. And Bobby Glover name took that block in and looked after him. And that block betrayed them. Because it was his uncle that shot them. And he spoke to his uncle. His uncle spoke to him. 
and order, offered them a bit of pie to bring them up and say it was a drug deal. And he talked to the two into coming and this boy took them out the road and shot the two of them. And I'll tell you a funny thing about that. That bloke palled out with me for quite a while. He's dead now. And he told me about that day. He says, Walter, he says, we got the two of them was the motor. He says, and this was his nephew that set them up. He says, and when I shot the two of them, he says, he says, I stepped to the motor, he says, and I shot them. He says, when I shot the first one, he says, I went, oh, wait a minute, he says, and I shot him. He says, and a bullet flew by my head. He says, I turned round, he says, and my nephew went, oh, sorry, I didn't mean it, it was a mistake. He says, I think he was going to do me. I said, I was talking to him that day, I says, Billy, you're not sure. He said, so by this time, the nephew's back in the neck. He said, I'm going to do it when he comes out. I know enough about what happened, but I don't know everything. Uh, other people who have been fortunate enough to talk to other people, bear in mind it's still a live murder inquiry as well. Uh, we've got a fair idea about what had happened and what had took place. And my understanding is that there are still members of Joe Hanlon's family who are the Irish based. Uh, are seeking uh, clarification on the whereabouts of two individuals that they believe strongly enough that were responsible. One's Billy Loban, William Loban, for take, making the phone call. And another one will be remained unnamed. Uh, but it was done in such a way that it was though Thompson organised that. I don't believe Thompson organised anything of that nature. I might, he might be aware of the significance of it, but I think it was a joint venture between him and McGraw. Sam McGraw was a prolific arm robber whose gang targeted post offices throughout Scotland. He also ran a fleet of ice cream vans, which were used to distribute drugs around Glasgow's many housing estates. Can you describe McGraw just briefly, what, what he was all about? To sum it up in one word, uh, two words, uh, fucking snake. Uh, and, the, and the reason why I say that is because a lot of people told me what he was all about. Now, there's a difference of people telling you for what he's all about. And people tell other people to watch what other people are all about for a simple reason. Because uh, if you don't tell them and something happens, what's the point of saying later on down the line, well, we could have told you. The first guy that told me anything about uh, my girl was Tam Began, because I had to move uh, from Proven Mill to Balarnock unwittingly thinking that I'm going to escape the D division where I'd been fitted up with the others to carry on and had audio tapes of cops talking about fitting me up and killing me and all the rest of it. And I thought the naivety of moving away from there into another area uh, would have prevented this, but it still stark light. And he, he, he warned me when I moved into the area, he says, one guy you've got to watch out for is McGraw. Watch what you're fucking doing, Will. And uh, later on, me and Tam uh, had a, a kind of a disagreement, for want of a better thing. And Joe Hanlon had some money uh, belonging to me that I'd asked him to, to look after. Uh, and it turns out Joe had asked Tam McGraw to put it in his safe. And when I asked Joe for the money and he told me where it was, I thought, that's the last guy I want to know that I've got money lying about. And uh, we went round and collected it out of his safe. And obviously he heard about the disagreement and openly said to me, uh, if you've got that much of a problem with Tam Began, don't worry about it. We'll get people that will just take him out. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, Bradley and Henderson that would stick smack in his car and get him fitted up. Openly, as, as much as you would say, would you want a light or do you want more sugar in your tea? Total deadpan expression. Obviously, what I heard about him was factually true. 
and that's at the time I said to Joe Hanlon, you obviously heard what you, you obviously heard what he just fucking said there, Joe. I would advise you to fuck off. And as far as I, I spoke direct to McGraw, and I said to him, as far as how you resolve your problems, I don't resolve any problems like that. And what I've heard about you, you've just clarified everything. The lucrative drugs business being run out of McGraw's ice cream vans led to other villains trying to take over from him. Shotguns were used to blow out the windscreens of several vehicles. Vans on both sides of the divide were burnt out and numerous individuals were attacked. This spate of incidents later became known as the Ice Cream Wars. Matters came to a head early one morning when the home of one ice cream vendor was doused in petrol and set alight. Six members of the Doyle family died in the blaze. One was an 18-month-old baby. Joe Steele was one of several men who were arrested, charged with murder and remanded in custody. I was lying in my bed on the 16th April. My mother, my grandmother, my uncle. Uh, my grandmother was blind. My mum had bad hearing, and my uncle had uh, previous convictions for safe blowing armed robbery. So I never had much an alibi, but it was the truth. I was in my bed with a flu. And uh, my, mother, my grandmother used to listen to a wee radio with VHF, she'd listen to the police and that. And I remember her saying to me, Where's Bank? I, I said to her, Where's Bank Kent Street? And my mum said, Cran over. Uh, the case is somehow, and I tell her about the fire. My old granny, who's in her prayers and holy, she said, uh, God bless and save us, can say there were a fire on Bank Kent Street and occupants were trapped. So then the next morning, uh, it was on the news, uh, one or two people died. And after that, I think they were dying every couple of days. So it was sad, it was a hor horrible thing, for, whether it's for ice cream fans or anything, it, it shouldn't have harmed, it shouldn't have harmed. Can you explain why why the Doyles were targeted? Yeah, I've been asked that question a million times, not really, but they certainly didn't deserve what happened, that's for sure. And why they were targeted today by ice cream vans? They were a quiet farm, a decent farm, they weren't the villains. But everybody more or less involved in the ice cream car on. Certainly didn't deserve that. Uh, they were just a, an ordinary family, went about a business and done a, a wee job. The sad thing is, the boy that died was going to chuck that. Running was working his brother in the butchers the next day, and that harmed right to his farm. It sad, but... So the Doyles, did a, they had an ice cream va van? Well, he worked in it. I don't think he owned it. I think he worked in it for Jimmy Mitchell. But he, I don't think he owned it. He was just getting a wage, boy. To be accused, he killed a family, a kid. And it's just sick and heed. It's, it's, if I'd have done that, I'd have, I'd have taught myself. I'd have taught myself. I'd have done that family. And just to be accused of the stigma, the press, the papers, ice cream monsters, child killers, I've got kids. I don't really end the right in my family. Can, can you remember the names of the people who you allegedly, the police said you killed and roughly what their ages were? Everything. I, I, I won't ever done it. I'm, I'm 50, that kid. See, I, I, my boy was only 18 months or so my time. That kid would be 30, married, college, whatever. Never got a chance to do that. I say only Mark Carlin, the kid's name is, I'll not forget it. Never. The murder of the Doyle family shocked the nation. Steele not only believed that Tam McGraw was responsible for the crime, but he also believes McGraw implicated him in the murders so that the PF, the prosecutor fiscal, would reward him with his freedom. I remember we were in Seabot and Bellini, and we were all hanging out of galleries, waiting for visits and things like that. Obviously, you hear the phone ring in the office, could be a visit. Anyway, phone rings, Tam McGraw was shouted off for a visit. He stood in the office, he came back up and he says, I'm getting a PF release. And we all looked at each other and we said, you mean you're getting a PF release? Because he was meant to be the main man and how are we getting a PF release? Uh, I think it was Tommy Campbell who said it to him. Uh, as in, how are you getting it? We're no, we're all innocent, can I? And uh, McGraw turned around and rung it and he said, we're all getting a PF release. Even at the door there and then, and I hadn't seen him since. He was the only one to get a PF release. And wh wh why do you think he, he's the one who was released? I think he was, I think he was feeding them lies. I think he was telling the police lies to put other people away. I believe Tom McGraw was involved to some extent, whether it was ordering that or whatever, 
I believe that's another match. Yeah, but I believe he was behind that, eye. Like Joe Steele, Paul Ferris was also protesting his innocence from within Barlini Jail. He was claiming that he'd been set up by a police informer over the death of Arthur Thompson, Jr. And the, the segregation unit was a guy called Dennis Sidney Wilkerson, also known as Dennis Woodman, and a whole variety of different other names, who had been toured through the English penal system as a supergrass. Uh, he was never a supergrass, he was a serial perjurer, because he, he made up confessions uh, with other people, but at that time we never knew who he was. And because I get bail, uh, he approached the chief constable of Ayrshire, I think it was. I don't think he, it was Glasgow at the time. I think he approached the hierarchy, the, the police hierarchy in, in, in Ayrshire, in relation to the charge that was on the for. And then elevated his information about, I confessed to the murder of the Thompson Jr. I confessed to uh, the attempted murder of Thompson Senior. I was going to blow the house up. I offered to set him up on drug deals and the whole fucking catalogue of things that it's very difficult even to imagine uh, taking place in the segregation unit when your window opens about three inches and at any given time he was seven cells away. Uh, so that was what the Crown used and revoked my bail took me back and they called it the longest uh, murder trial in, law in Scottish legal history, when in fact it was a, the longest uh, farce in law Scottish legal history because that was their evidence. Following Ferris's release, the Glasgow underworld was poised for an all-out war between those loyal to Arthur Thompson and those loyal to Ferris. Acknowledging Arthur's unpredictable violent reputation Ferris was warned to leave the city by his friends. There was loads of people that were advising me, like, you better leave Glasgow, you better do this, you better do that. And I thought at the time, I can't, I can't afford to do that. Purely because Joe Hanlon's widow, Bobby Glover's widow, all the people that stood by me through the trial, I wasn't going to abandon them. To, to, and it wasn't a matter of stubborn pride or anything at all. I had to find out things about what happened to my two friends and, and what was prepared to get done about it. I, I, I had no time for thinking about going away, but I knew there, there was a, a time scale in which I had to go away to recoup and, and probably rest ahead of it a, a bit. And uh, eventually I did do that. I went to Manchester and uh, 19... End of 1993, so I stayed for about a year in Glasgow, uh, a year and a bit. Went to Manchester on the basis of spending a weekend with uh, Rob Carruthers and was introduced to free base uh, cocaine and uh, just lost two years uh, uh, in my life staying in Manchester. Ferris was not the first Scottish villain to have settled in Manchester. Glaswegians were once blamed for a 50% rise in violent crime in the city. Manchester, or Gunchester as it has become known, has produced plenty of its own villains and continues to do so. In recent years, soaring gun crime figures, grenade attacks and murder of police officers have resulted in a phrase being coined, hell they say is a city called Manchester. <laughs> 